window. Welcome. We're glad that you're here this morning. And let me read to you a passage of scripture as we call to worship here this morning. It is from Psalms 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. Right? Now, I didn't ask you when you came in, but um, I'm assuming that nobody's here saying, I'm not a righteous person. I'm a terrible person, you know. So that means we all can sing to the Lord this morning, right? Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting and upright to praise Him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to Him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy to the Lord. One of the great things about the Psalms is if you don't have any musical talent, it doesn't matter because it tells you to make the noise to the Lord, right? And sing to him and shout to him. We want to celebrate our God this morning. Let's pray and invite his presence here. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship. Lord, it is our privilege, and we do this morning with joy want to sing your praises. So we invite you into this place, Lord. Fill it with your precious Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts, Lord, and be glorified in all that we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand. Let's worship the Lord together. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your worth. King over all the universe, to you be the glory. alive because I'm alive in you and it's all because of Jesus I'm alive and it's all because of blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises this dead man's life and it's all because of Jesus I'm alive Giver of every breath I breathe Author of all eternity Giver of every perfect thing To you be the glory Maker of heaven and the No one can comprehend your world King over all the universe To you be the glory And I'm alive because I'm alive in you And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive And it's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises dead man's life and it's all because of Jesus every sunrise brings your praise the universe cries out your praise I'm singing freedom all my days now that I'm alive and it's all because of Jesus I'm alive and it's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raised this dead man's life. And it's all because of Jesus. And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. And it's all because the blood of Jesus Christ. 
that covers me and raises this dead man's life. And it's all because of Jesus, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm you to remain standing because it is time for our alabaster offering. If you don't know what alabaster offering is all about, it is uh, twice a year we uh, gather um, all of any change and stuff that we, you know, I'm sure as you go home you take out of your pockets and put somewhere and we take that money and we give it to the mission field to build schools and hospitals and to further God's kingdom. So um, we're going to give at this time, if you just uh, would bring it right up here, and the the worship team is going to uh, play as they sing, and then you can can come and give your alabaster offering, and then you can go and uh, be seated after that. So God, we ask your blessing upon this offering to touch and minister. Lord, build your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come as we get.
Would you please stand with us once again? I spent in vanity and pride Daring not my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me He died at Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free Pardon there was multiplied to Offer this. 
want to share some quick announcements with you. I don't know if you've noticed, first of all, that um, as you're coming in on Sunday mornings, the announcements are running on the screen for you to, uh, uh, to read, so um, that keep you informed. But I do want to highlight just, uh, just a couple. The first is this evening at 6 o'clock, we will be having uh, our uh, Discussion time, a small group discussion about uh, uh, about the the sermon and the, uh, the your readings in the Advent. So uh, come on out for that tonight. It begins. It'd be in the uh, the chapel there, uh, six o'clock tonight. So uh, for our uh, just a time, very relaxed time of just uh, talking, sharing, questioning together uh, to help each. each each other grow spiritually and um, as we are on this Lenten journey. So take part in that. Then I do want to ask, we'd like to have a, um, as part of our Easter Sunday morning celebration, we'd like to um, uh, take part of that service and have a baptism service. Now, um, there are a couple elements you need for baptism, right? You need water, um, which... Uh, the, uh, the town will provide for us, so um, as long as we pay them. Um, you know, <laughs> there's, there's water, right? There's a place to be baptized, which we have that uh, right underneath the cross. And the third element we need is people that will be baptized, right? So if you would like to be baptized on Easter Sunday morning, if you would see me, um, there's no test or anything. I just want to uh, talk to you about it um, for a moment and uh, get you on that uh, list. Now, if you're wondering, well, should I be baptized? First of all, if you are a Christian, you should be baptized. It is uh, Scripture calls us to do that. Jesus did that, right? Uh, when he gave us the Great Commission, right? He's go and make disciples do what? Baptizing them, right? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
Peter, in his, uh, when he preached in his challenge, said, repent and be baptized, right? So if you are a Christian, it's very important part of the Christian walk to be baptized. Um, and uh, you know, if you are, in a sense, afraid of the water, don't worry. We can, we can sprinkle you, right? Uh, I'll only hold you under as long as the many sins that you've committed. Um, <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> you know, so don't worry about that, but uh, we, you can be a part of that. Uh, now, if you were baptized as a child, maybe you came from a, a different tradition or whatever, um, I would strongly urge you to be baptized as a believer. This is a believer baptism. This is a declaration that you, uh, Jesus Christ, has washed away your sins. So important for you to be a part of that. So if you would like to be baptized, uh, or if you know someone, okay, this is a sacrament of the Lord, so you do not have to be a member of this church to be baptized, all right? This is something from God um, to, for us to do. But if you would see me, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, along with that, if you're not a member of the church, right, um, I'd love to have a baptism and bring in new members on Easter Sunday morning. It's a great way to celebrate. So if you're not a member of this uh, great church, we'd love to talk to you about uh, becoming a member. Um, so you can see me as well about that. Well, let's ask our ushers to come as we give to the Lord this morning. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, it is our privilege and our honor. And Lord, it is a part of our worship. So receive these gifts, we ask, O oh God. And may, Lord, they touch lives and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Lent tends to get a bad rap from quite a few people, honestly. And I think one of the reasons that Lent gets a bad rap is that, that people have seen people abuse, really, I, I, I would call it the gift of Lent. Uh, and so it becomes kind of an empty ritual, kind of devoid of its forming power for our souls. Uh, and, and so I, I honestly think anything can become an empty ritual. And so I want to encourage you just in this quick video to reconsider as a Christian how Lent might come into your other disciplines and begin to shape you as a follower of Jesus Christ. See, Lent historically has been used by the people of God for thousands of years to turn their attention to Jesus heading towards Jerusalem to die for our sins. It's a way that the church has prepared its heart for Easter to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ after his sufferings on Good Friday. And so regardless of where you are in life, like even if I think about my family, our family celebrates Lent every year and already, even as I'm filming this, my family has begun to discuss what that will look like this year. So I have a seven-year-old daughter who, who has decided that she is going to give up soda for Lent and so that every time she wants a soda, she wants to be reminded of the suffering of Jesus Christ for her sins and to be drawn into, once again, the gospel story and my son is going to do no cookies he's 11 so he's just giving up cookies and my wife and I we're, we're a bit more uh, complex and robust in what we're giving up but but the at the end of the day the goal isn't let's give up all these things but it's how do I reorient my heart in this season to remember the sufferings of Jesus Christ for my sins so that on Easter Sunday morning that I rejoice in a way that I would not be able to rejoice if Easter snuck up on me. And, and you and I both know in the season in which our lives are playing out, the pace and the speed of things is light speed. And so before we know it, we're at Easter Sunday morning and our hearts haven't been prepared for that and our spirits haven't been prepared for that. And Lent is one of those common grace gifts to all who, who belong to the body of Christ to participate in the preparation of our hearts for the Lord's death and resurrection. So I want to encourage you, give it a try this year and see if the Lord won't bless you. Would you please stand for the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings Yeah. Okay. 
children are dismissed at this time for Children's Church. And our altar is open for a time of prayer. You're welcome to find a place up front here to kneel and pray as we sing this song. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Thank you for the opportunity to come to you in prayer. Oh, what a privilege is ours to enter into your throne room. Thank you, Lord God. And Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace, your mercies that are new every morning. Oh, God, you are good. We celebrate you today. And Lord, we thank you that you encourage us to come and to give our burdens to you. That you invite us to, to leave them at your feet and you will give us rest. So Lord God, this morning we pray for each one here at the altar. We ask, O oh God, your touch, your healing. God, would you provide for their needs? Lord God, would you bring peace, strength, 
God, would you mend broken relationships? Lord, where, where nothing can be done, will you work your miracle power in their lives? And bless each one, Lord. We thank you that we know right now, Scripture tells us you are at work while they are asking, Lord. So meet their need, we pray. We want to lift up Al and Leona to you this morning, Lord, and the, the loss of Al's sister. We pray, Lord, for your comfort to surround them, your care, Father. Oh, would you just hold the family in your arms today, oh God. Minister to them. Lord, we ask as we are on this Lenten journey, would you teach us and show us and guide us, Father. God, we seek after you. Do a work in all of our lives. We pray, Lord, for this church. Help us. We want, oh God, to reach out, to touch lives, to share Jesus. God, would you open up our eyes? We know you are at work. Help us to join you, to say yes. And Lord, now as we open up your word, oh God, speak. For we're listening give you the glory and the honor and the praise. It all belongs to you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and faithfulness. Thank you for answering prayer this morning. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. journey water for the way and hopefully you Wednesday started to read the devotionals challenge as uh, during the offering there as the video said this is all about us seeking God turning our attention more towards him so that when Easter arrives we can celebrate a fresh and anew what God is doing. I want to share with you just some funny church signs this morning. And the first one is this, if your life stinks, we have a pew for you. <laughs> I don't know if you ever thought about it that way. <laughs> and then this one, uh, Adam and Eve were the first people to not read the Apple terms and conditions. Then this one, having trouble sleeping? Try one of our sermons. <laughs> it's a good thing Jim's downstairs and not up here, because I would hear a comment. <laughs> when you throw mud at someone, you lose ground. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Forgive your enemies. It will mess with their heads. Right? <laughs> Cremation is your last chance for a smoking hot body. (laughs) 
I think I'd go to that church just to see what they're preaching on. You know? <laughs> Acting perfect in church is like dressing up for an x-ray. <laughs> Give Satan an inch and he'll become your ruler. Wow. And sin is like a credit card. Enjoy it now, but pay for it later. Right? Wow. And finally, at the heart of every sin is the letter I. The heart of every sin is the letter I. You know, sin is sometimes treated as a taboo subject. Something people don't want to be confronted with or, or, or talk about. Others treat sin simply as a joke. Doesn't exist, right? Yet most of us readily admit that sin is a reality in our world, isn't it? It is a reality in our world. Even if we don't like to talk about our own sin, we can be quick to point out the sins in the lives of others, aren't we? The challenge for us is to recognize and admit that sin is something we also can fall prey to and something we must take seriously and deal with. Lent is a season for confronting our own Sin. That's why in Genesis where sin entered the world, it's, it's a kind of an ideal place for us to start this morning as we start this Lenten journey. Because the story is about Adam and Eve and, and sin entering into the world. It's a story about ourselves. And it's an age-old story we see played out over and over again in Life. If we think, oh, if Adam and Eve hadn't j done that, but no, over and over and over again, we sin against God. We choose that. We, we choosing our own way over God's way. And Lent is the season when we confront that and we move into a deeper relationship with God so that Easter may truly be a celebration of life, right? A celebration of resurrection from sin. So we're in Genesis chapter 2 this morning. Genesis chapter 2 as we begin this journey. And we're going to begin reading from verse 15. Genesis chapter 2 and begin with verse 15. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the serpent, moving on to chapter 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the, any tree in the garden? You see the twist there? The devil loves to just mix things up a bit, doesn't he? Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit, the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, 
your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. <coughs> so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. <coughs> From this Genesis story this morning, there are a few things that we need to recognize and apply because they, they also happen in our lives. And the first one is this, recognize God's abundant provision. We need to recognize God's abundant provision. Too often, we start discussions of our text with prohibition, right? We look at Genesis and say, okay, let's talk about Genesis. Let's talk about what God said we can't do. We immediately go toward the negative. It, it, it's kind of like what, the way we talk about Christianity today. Oh, you're a Christian? Yeah, that means I can't do this and that. Right. We need to recognize God's provision. Right. The emphasis in Genesis is actually here on the vast provisions of God. They are free to eat any tree, any fruit from any tree in the garden. Any of them. It's provided for them, except the one. But we automatically say, oh, the one, right? God is providing here for Adam and Eve. God has provided abundantly for them and for all of us. There's only one tree out of the vast abundance of trees that they aren't supposed to eat from. In fact, I can imagine this huge garden. So they would have to, maybe they had binoculars and said, okay, let me find that one tree right? out of the vast blessings of God. God created good for Adam and Eve. Everything was given to them with only one thing to stay away from, that one tree. It's kind of like, yeah, you ever been a thing where somebody says, now don't look at that light, right? God has provided for us. God has created a bounty that is for our well-being, our good. Do you know God wants good for your life? And he provides for you. In fact, everything that God says and does is for our good. Everything that God says. He speaks and he acts out of deep love for us. That's the reason we were created, for a love relationship with God. We are his treasure. And he provides for us. So many kind of wonder why God put that one tree in the garden. Sim simply put, it's because true love relationship, one that God desires with us, a love relationship, requires choice, right? It requires choice. It, it's, you know, I, when I proposed to Karen, I said, you will marry me. No, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> She would have anyways, right? No. <laughs> I didn't say, you will marry me. I said, will you? Because love relationship requires choice. So there's that one tree in the garden. Because we must choose God. 
I mean, God even stacked the odds against us making a bad choice, right? Vast amount of trees in the garden, all kinds of fruits, one tree. You choose. And if they eat from that one tree, they would die. Whether that death was immediate or at some point in the future, it wasn't clear in that passage, <coughs> but nevertheless, boom, you will die. And I don't have time to go into it this morning, but the definitions of that death are vast, right? How many of you know, first of all, we all die, don't we? I don't like it, do we? It's a cause of sin. How many of you know that the Bible says we're separated from God? Literally, if you go back in the, the original language, it's we are death from God. Right? So it actually did take place. If they eat from that tree, they will die. What's important in that is a consequence for disobedience, for not going God's way is death. So you see, even in that, we, we focus in on the punishment. But it's not really punishment. It's God saying, don't, don't go that way. You're going to fall off a cliff. Right? How many of you recognize if I told you, don't go this way because you're going to fall off. And when you fall off, you say, oh, Pastor Dave punished me. I warned you, right? God saying, don't eat from that tree. Here's all the provisions you need. Don't eat from the one. Because God wants our good. Well, secondly, this morning, recognize, blame the servant, or servant, serpent attitude. Blame the serpent attitude. Along comes the serpent. We aren't sure what the serpent represents. There are various, you know, people's ideas. It represents the devil in disguise. It's a metaphor for idolatry. It's a metaphor for ambition, right? What's important here, though, is understanding its role, which is to tempt Adam and Eve, right? To violate the boundary God has set, has given ask you this morning as we're on this Lenten journey, what things do you have in your life that tempt you to move away from God? Right now, in all of your lives, in my life as well, there are things that tempt us to move away from God. What are they in your life? What are they? The question the serpent asked emphasizes the crossing of that boundary. Walter Brueggemann says the serpent transforms the boundary of God. He moves the boundary, right? Remember, that boundary is there for protection, for our good. The boundary is meant for the good of humanity, but the serpent transforms it in their minds as something good, right? Something good. That God is trying to keep you away from. It is a question prevalent in the minds of people today. How can a loving God keep me from doing that? And God's saying, it's because I love you that I don't want you to do that. Do you know what's interesting? In the people that are outright sinning against God. They're very unhappy people if you talk to them. Right? Oh, they try to put on a good face, but they're very unhappy people. Why? Because God didn't want them to go that direction, not just to say, I want to prohibit you from something good, but I want to keep you from something that's harmful. to keep you from something that's harmful. 
They had, Adam and Eve had every good thing. They only had one boundary, yet suddenly they fixate on that boundary, right? Oh, how many of us do that in our lives? Oh, God is blessing, God is giving, God is providing, but God won't let me do this. We fixate on the boundary, right? They notice that the fruit is pleasing to the eye. That is good for food and that is desirable for gaining wisdom. And of course, this, this must be okay with God because it looks so good. The focus moves off of God and onto what they think they deserve or are entitled to. Right? No thought to why God would put that boundary in place. What are the boundaries in your life? That God is trying to help you, protect you. What are those boundaries? You see, this temptation, is it really a temptation not to trust God? I mean, come on, let's be honest. There are days when we think, God, I know better. We may not say that out loud, but... God, I, I, I know better. God works for our good. And it's, this is the temptation of who knows best, God or, or us? Humans have been placed as caretakers of creation, yet here's creation, things and actions and stuff, Trying to rule humanity, right? I've told you over and over again that, uh, about my counseling and uh, several men that I've counseled about pornography. And one of the things that happens is pornography ends up ruling them. They can't help it any longer. They can't control it any longer. You know, God places boundaries so that things in this world will not rule us. So that we could be ruled by God, right? And ultimately, uh, that boundary, crossing it is a choice by Adam and Eve. The devil didn't make them do it. Oh, it was the serpent. No. A choice. They weren't under forces they couldn't control. They chose to trust in themselves over trusting in God. Creation knows better than the creator. The clay talks back to the potter, right? That's what was taking place. And then they don't just, they don't stop there, but it wasn't me. It was the serpent. How many people say, it's not my fault. It's the world. Right? They blame the serpent. They blame the serpent. How often do we not deal with our sin in our lives, but instead hide behind a finger that's pointed at somebody else? Right? That is why scripture calls upon us to confess our sins. Does God know what we've done? Oh, he does. But he wants us to take responsibility for it. Own it up to it, right? Repent, feel, or express that regret. Well, number three, recognize the blaming of the woman. Any guys want to say amen? No. <laughs> Any guys feel blessed at this point? Anybody want to have me over for dinner because I can't go home? You know. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Recognize the blaming of the woman. In exchange for the, the, the serpent, the you pronouns here are plural in the Hebrew. So this whole time, God is addressing 
Adam and Eve. And so is the serpent. It's plural. And scripture tells us in verse 6, Adam was right there. He heard everything. He was. God says, stay away from the tree. Adam is right there. Right? Not to mention the fact that Eve eats of the apple, turns around and hands it to Adam. And of course, this big debate goes on about whether he should eat it or not. No. Bible says he ate. Right away. He ate. Both choose to eat. It is not that one particular person had sinned and then caused another to sin, but oh, how often we, we say that, you know. It's not really my fault. George, you know, he did it first and he caused me to do it. No. Sin's a choice. In fact, the excuse, everybody's doing it, is so popular these days, isn't it? In regards to sin. Somehow, majority rule is more powerful than God rule. And the more people that sin, the more I feel better about my sin. Right? The focus, again, is off God and onto others. And even the church has brought it in, bought into this mentality, right? We need to accept and practice this because the world's doing it, right? And God says, no, no, no. I've given you all this, one tree. But it's so popular. No. Right? Everybody's doing it is not an excuse. To sin. The shifting of the blame begins in verses 12 and 13. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent, right? Let's just pass the buck. You know, I'm convinced that, that that's one reason why God kind of implemented Lent into the church. Why? Because we're so busy t saying it's, all, it's the other person's fault. We need to take time to examine our lives. What's our part in it? Right. Well, number four, recognize sin leads to shame and hiding from God. Sin leads to shame and hiding from God. Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves for clothes for themselves when they realized we're naked before God. It doesn't take long for their guilt over their sin to turn into shame. What causes them to hide from God, the shame and the guilt? I know I'm not supposed to be doing it, and I did it. And they hide from God. You know what? Whether it's in the world or in the church, we make it a habit of hiding from God. But God knows. He knows. We need to recognize sin leads to shame and shame leads to hiding from God. And we're created for an intimate, close relationship with God. So when we sin, God knows and the relationship is broken and and we're revealed naked before God. There's no hiding it from God. Or, oh, I, I will just sneak this particular sin by him. Right? Oh, come on. Thought has crossed your mind. It's just a little sin. I can sneak it by God. There's no little sin that does not affect us. Remember, God is working for our good. He's providing for our good. And so sin wrecks that. I wonder this morning, I don't know if you ever thought about this, how might this story have ended if Adam and Eve didn't hide from God? If when they sinned, they fell on their knees and looked to God and said, God, we blew it. We ask you forgiveness. I bet the story would have been radically 
different. Now, yes, sin did enter into the world through that event in the garden. I'm not saying that sin wouldn't have entered into the world, but I would imagine that the damage to Adam and Eve would have been a lot less had they opened themselves up openly before God. Said, so God, I blew it. Right? God, I, I need your forgiveness. What if they had admitted their sin to God instead of hiding? You know what? God does not expect us to be perfect. But he does expect us to come clean before him. It's called repent. Right? It's called repent. Come clean before God, and God will forgive and restore. That's what he's in the business of. God's not up there in the business of saying, boy, if you make a mistake, I've got you. I've had people in my office as a pastor that, that kind of think God has this you know, the kind of cartoon figure giant hammer, and he's going to go boom as soon as you make that mistake. No. God says, come to me. I'm offering forgiveness. Right? Restoration. I want to heal you. In fact, many times we don't confess our sin. We don't go to God over it because we're worried about punishment. Jesus already took the punishment for us. He already did. So what if Adam and Eve had chosen to run toward God instead of hiding? Confessing their sin openly instead of covering it up. Would that have been radically different consequences? See, maybe, um, yeah, yes, they sinned, they ate them the apple, but I think that hiding from God complicated things, made it worse. Right. Instead of blaming others or blaming the situation, we need to take the responsibility for our own actions. Right. Instead of lying to ourselves, hiding, thinking we can, we can hide from God. If I just grab these fig leaves and Go over by that bush. God will never know. Yes, he. You know what's interesting? God was walking through the garden, and it says, calling out, Adam, where are you? Now, he's God. He knew where Adam was. But it's a, it's a demonstration on our part. God was seeking after Adam and Eve. Will we go to him? But if I confess my sin, how will God respond? Luke 15, 7. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Do you know we take this passage and we, we kind of use it just for first time salvation people, right? Someone who's never accepted Christ before, they accept Christ. Okay, heaven rejoices. But that's not what this passage says. It says any sinner. Anyone who sinned, who repents, heaven rejoices. What if Adam and Eve went to God? God, we blew it. We need your forgiveness. Luke says, all of heaven would have rejoiced. Right? Instead of hiding, we need to go to God, right? Some people come to Lent and they say, oh, no, another time of examining myself and confessing my sin. I hate that. Why? <laughs> we receive grace. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. 
If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive my sin and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. Heaven rejoices when I come before God and say, God, I blew it. Would you forgive? You see, you know what? During Lent, may we stop running in the wrong direction. There's a passage of scripture that during Lent, many people often quote, and I think they, they miss some parts in the middle. It says, if my people, right? Who's my people? Christians. If my people who are called by my name, Christians, Christ, followers, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and then, you know, we kind of smudge that part in our Bible so we can't read the next part, and turn from their wicked Come to God. God, I blew it. Confess to him. It says then. That word, that little word then is powerful. Because this, it, it's almost like a contract there. It's saying, you do this, and God will do this. If my people who are called by name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. God will come and heal. God will come and restore. God will come and heaven will rejoice. Right? During Lent, let's run toward God. Oh, pastor, you don't know what I've done. Let's run toward God. But how is he going to respond? Let's run toward God. But the punishment, Jesus has already taken care of that. Let's run toward God and allow him to do something in our lives. Because you know what? When he does that, only then will Easter truly be a celebration of life. Of I've been resurrected from sin. As we travel, will you, will you do that these 40 days as we travel together? Would you just be honest before God? Would you recognize the boundaries and the temptations and allow God to work? Allow God to restore. Stand as we close in prayer. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for your great love, for your great mercy for us. God, I pray over these next several weeks as we pray and study and run to you, God, may you restore. May Easter truly be a time when our lives have been resurrected and made new. I pray a blessing upon each person here. Encourage and minister each one. Oh, Lord, thank you for these people. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.